Okay, well, it is 12.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to uh, this webinar and our continuing egg market situation outlook webinar series. Uh, this week, we'll be focusing primarily on CFAP, the coronavirus uh, food assistance program, uh, in addition to some general market uh, information. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Brian Parman, egg finance specialist. Hey, thanks, Dave. So as, as always, I'm gonna uh, do a little bit of a macro uh, update, as well as uh, hit on some of the key macro kind of ag points, the, the bigger picture stuff. Um, I, it's not, and I'm trying to keep the topics a little bit fresh week to week. It's not that the other things have become unimportant. It's mainly that things, uh, I try to hit on different stuff if it isn't changing. So in my first slide, what I, what I want to highlight here is that the, the political tensions between the U.S. and China seem to be, uh, if the, at the very least, not getting any better and are heating up quite a bit. Uh, there was a resolution passed, actually a bipartisan resolution, of delisting a bunch of Chinese firms from U.S. stock exchanges. Um, it's been brought up that, or the point has been made that this is because they are not, uh, these Chinese firms are not acting under the same regulations that the, that the U.S. firms have to with regards to the Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC. And there's about 156 of these Chinese firms, total value at about 1.2 trillion. And they've pointed to the, those in Congress that passed the law initially that billions have been lost due to fraud by, uh, due to fraud. Um, that's uh, defrauded U.S. investors. And one example they gave was this Luck and Coffee company fabricating $310 million in sales, which wouldn't happen in the U.S. due to SEC audits and self-reporting that are required, you know, post Enron and some of these other big flops that have happened over the years. But we don't have the same kind of control. But then the flip side to that has been, is it retaliation for what is perceived to be China's stance on the virus and its spread and misinformation and retaliation for that? So we'll see how, uh, how this transpires, but I can't imagine that it's not going to have an impact on our trade negotiation that we already have with them. Um, it's going to, access to capital is going to be a lot more limited for these firms that are delisted. Moving on to unemployment again, I hit this week over week because it's an ongoing problem and continues to uh, remain a big problem. So last week's numbers, 2.438 million uh, on unemployment uh, at the end of last week. The trend is, if you look at the red dotted line, the trend is moving in the right direction. It's getting better, but still 2.4 million would be a record in and of itself had it not been for the last eight or so weeks. So while it is headed in the right direction, this is just a staggering amounts of people week over week being added to the unemployment rolls. Uh, again, you know, 2.43 million would have been five, six times the last, the previous record of 30 years ago. It's just not as big as it was six, seven weeks ago. So continued unemployment, which is shown on my next chart, just shows you see the line keeps creeping up. That's because we keep adding more and more people to the unemployment rolls. As of the end, of approximately the middle of a few weeks ago, 25.07 uh, million continuous jobs claims. These are people who continue to file week over week. So as you'd expect, that number keeps going up. And that's pretty staggering when you consider to start March, it was 1.7 million. And by here, mid-May, we're looking at 25 million, okay? So the Congressional Budget Office um, did some projections, okay? So we've had industry projections for when this is gonna end and how bad it's gonna be. Lots of industry projections. We've had in, uh, projections from the Federal Reserve Districts. And the CBO just put out their projections. They're expecting unemployment to average 9.3% for the next year, peaking at about 15.8% or 16% almost next quarter. And by the end of 2020, being at 11.5, 11.5 is about 2% higher than it was at the height of the financial crisis. So that is a very large unemployment statistic. Um, expected at the end of the year. They expect the economy will contract at an annualized 37.7%, which would be like saying we lost 40% of the economy in the year. It won't be that high in quarter two in terms of the actual percentage decline, but what they're saying is quarter two, annualized 37.7%. In other words, if this continued for a year, we'd lose almost 40% of the economy. 
which would be at a, uh, catastrophic. So the ex expectation is we'll increase at 21.5% and then 10.5% in quarters three and four. This is assuming no big flare up, no additional shutdowns coming in the future. So this is kind of a, not a best case scenario, but a reasonably optimistic scenario. And we'll finish 2020 with a five and a half to 6% contraction at the end of the year. So if everything goes well, this is what we can expect. All right, so it's not the grimmest outlook by, by any means, but it's also not rosy either. And it doesn't really speak to a V type recovery. It's more of a, a Nike swoosh sign, if you will, down and then kind of trailing off at a much shallower curve. Okay, so let's talk about some ag uh, statistics that came out from our Federal Reserve District, which is the Minneapolis Fed. And they ask lenders these questions uh, every quarter and then they get the percentage of respondents. So in the first table here, North Dakota is the column in red. So for instance, they asked the question, percent of respondents who reported decreased levels for the past three months when compared to the same period last year. So the top line, rate of loan repayments, 71% of lenders said that had decreased in North Dakota. 76% saying net farm incomes had decreased. About half saying farm household spending and capital spending, most are saying that that's down. Okay, what's interesting is that loan demand is down. Uh, 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 only 12, I'm sorry, 12% 12 have said loan demand has decreased, which would imply that it's either 88% has stayed the same or increased. Loan renewals or extensions, percent of respondents in the bottom half is an increased level. So 65% increase in loan renewals or extensions. And this is in number of lenders, not loan volume or quantity of dollars coming through. This is each nose, right? Each lender. Referrals to under lend other lenders has not really increased very much amount of collateral required. Now loan demand, 47% are saying it's up. So that's, that's, a, that's a pretty big number. So the next slide, it talks about expectations. Okay, so the last slide was on what they've seen. This one, this table shows expectations. The top is also decreased, talking about decreases. 53% uh, expect a decrease in loan uh, rate of loan repayments in the next three months. Big percentage, 82% expecting a decrease in net farm income. Now, if you look at the column just to the left of North Dakota with all the hundreds, that's Montana. So not a lot of optimistic lenders in, in Montana at all. Um, increase in loans and renewals or extensions, that would be the next, the bottom half of the table, 71% increase there. And then 71% expect an increase in loan demand. So most lenders surveyed across North Dakota and really the district are expecting a lot of uh, financial hardship, some, some struggles coming forward and expecting that their uh, loan demand, rates of re loan demand is going to be up, um, net farm incomes down, rate of loan repayments down things like that. So the, so most, most lenders don't, do not have a rosy outlook for the next quarter or so. So the Minneapolis Federal Reserve also does a survey on interest rates and uh, they ask them for the quarter, uh, each quarter. And one, an, a bright spot here, if you look on the right, the bottom right, uh, so that, those two columns are real estate values. Fixed rates are down to the lowest they've been in a while at 4.9% across the, our district and variable rates not very far behind it, which you would imagine um, variable rates are usually considerably lower than fixed interest rates, but they've come down so fast and with interest rates, at, at least as far as the risk-free rate being basically zero, uh, you add prime to that and everything else and, and your variable rates and fixed rates are, are pretty close to one another. In fact, whether it's operating machinery and real estate, they're, they're the closest they've been in a while by in many cases, a point operating operating loan interest rates are down a lot since uh, since last year, um, well over one percent uh, across the board. So, so that's that is one bright spot heading into the next year. This will have a positive impact on land values. This will have a positive impact on individuals having to do any restructure or terming out debt or anything like that. So, at least we have that going for us right now. So real quick, I want to shift gears for the last portion and talk real quick about uh, uh, fertilizer costs. So the red line at the bottom of this is the average weekly retail price of DAP. Okay. And if you look, the gray dotted line is the five-year average. 
the purple is 2018 and the green is 2019. And we are really cheap. We have really cheap uh, DAP this year heading into planting season. So that's another bright spot by, by quite a bit, almost uh, about $75 a ton. Uh, so that, so that's been uh, pretty helpful. Uh, the next slide shows the retail prices of anhydrous. 2020 again, anhydrous has been pretty flat. Typically we see a increase in anhydrous prices as planting season progresses. If you look at the dotted line again, the five-year average, you look at 2019, and then you look at 2018, and in all three of those, that, those cases, you see this sort of increase heading into May. Well, fortunately for us in North Dakota, uh, we're running hot and heavy into planting season and we're not seeing an increase in, in anhydrous at all. So that's, that's helpful. Not that we put on anhydrous, but remember anhydrous is pretty much the, the precursor to UAN 2832 and urea. And so then my final slide here, I just wanna show urea prices. Now, unfortunately they are above last year's price, but still below the five year average and they have increased uh, this spring and it's really one of the only the only components that has increased has been has been urea, uh, and it's increased some, uh, not not a terrible lot maybe since March about fifteen dollars a ton, but still well below the five year average and below twenty nineteen. So we're paying uh, a good uh, we can expect hopefully to pay a good thirty or so dollars a ton less for our urea this year, um, which again is another another benefit. So there is some good news with what's. What, what we're looking at in ag in terms of lower interest rates, lower fertilizer prices, those are certainly gonna be helpful, especially to those who are using a lot of phosphorus this spring and, and using a lot of uh, nitrogen fertilizers. So I believe our next speaker, and I'll turn it over, is Ron Haugen, who will be uh, talking about some policy. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Ron Haugen, Extension Farm Management Specialist with the, with the NDSU Extension Service. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, CFAP, the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. Uh, we knew that there was money available for this from <clears throat> quite a while ago, and we've been waiting and waiting to for, find out how the, how the uh, feds have uh, sorted it all out. So I'm going to go through what we know. It just Some of the rules just came out here a couple days ago, and we don't, of course, know everything right now. Uh, there's just been, been a real frenzy for to find information out right away. But it, like most of these, most of this legislation that we've dealt with the last uh, two months, I mean, the rules change next week, the rules will be different. So what we're telling you today is what we know now, and, and not that something wouldn't change. And if, and, and, and if some people don't like some of the, some of the things that show up, um, uh, then, uh, then uh, there, there may be some changes in the future. Well, my first slide shows, the, shows a couple of pie charts and I'll, uh, as we know, there was 19 billion that was allocated and 3 billion of that was for uh, food purchases. And then the pie chart on the next, uh, next uh, uh, not on the next slide, but the next pie chart there shows kind of the breakout, how everything was kind of supposed to be divvied up um, with cattle producers getting the most. And that isn't really set in stone either. Um, there was 40, as I mentioned, there was 40 billion in requests from various commodity groups and, and organizations but they had 16 billion, so they, the USDA kind of sorted it out, and this is what we ended up with. So the first, the next slide shows some background here. Um, there's actually two separate payments from two separate sources. Part of the money comes from the CARES Act, and part of the uh, money comes from the CCC, the Commodity Credit Corporation. Um, and, but the, the, the payment rates are calculated in, in a similar fashion. And the, ba the basics is it, they, they chose the week of January 13th to the 17th and comparing to the week of April 6th to the 9th. Um, and, and, and what it was was they're trying to figure out what effect the COVID had on the, on the various commodities, okay? So any commodity that, not, that did not experience a drop of, uh, a, a drop of over uh, uh, 5% uh, is not included. And, and USDA could... Uh, uh, could reconsider some of that if there's some supporting evidence to that. The next slide shows a, shows a graph of the various commodities and uh, of the declines. And you can see that hogs have gotten the biggest, the biggest uh, brunt of it and uh, wheat, 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 wheat with the least, soybeans and corn bringing up the, the middle there. Um, so they broke it up. The next slide then will show you the, how they broke it up 
into various uh, various uh, commodities and what they call the non-specialty crops. And that's what typically would be, we would call field crops. Um, it's not fruits and vegetables. Um, and also wool goes into this area. Um, and you can see the list there, malting barley, canola, corn, cotton, millet, oats, soybeans, sorghum, sunflowers, durum wheat, hard red spring wheat. Some crops are not included in that. And I have a list on the, on the, on the back slide to show you which ones are not. There may be some, some bark back at that. Different groups may want to get their, to get their uh, uh, crop included. Um, and, and the payment structure, the payment is based on this. The payment is based on the, in, uh, on the inventory subject to price risk as of January 15th, okay? The payment is made based on 50% of the producer's um, 2019 production, total production, or the 2019 inventory as of uh, January 15th, whichever is smaller. And then you multiply that by the ap applicable rate for the commodity. Now, what this is, if you sold your, your commodities before January, you probably got a better price because things have been drooping since the COVID hit. And uh, so then people are saying, well, is this a bailout for poor marketers? Well, it's 50%. Uh, you're still better off if you happen to be luck out on the market and sell it before this time. Uh, because this program will not make you whole by any means, uh, so you're still better. It, you're still better off, but it does. It, it's just helping people out. And there's a lot of questions on on what is inventory subject to price risk. If you have grain in the elevator on a price uh, a price later contract, well, you definitely have price risk. But is that inventory? You technically own that or not? If you do have a, a, a uh, forward price contract, well, definitely the price, it has been priced, uh, and, and, but then is that inventory or not? On a basis contract, you've, you've minimized your basis risk, but you still have price risk. So there's a lot of, and then do you, do you have a puts or calls? Do you have, do you have uh, uh, futures contracts? A lot of unknowns there that will be ironed out in, in the future, I'm sure. So the next slide shows a chart with the non-specialty crops and the various payments for the various commodities. And the CARES Act has one set of payments. The CCC has another set of payments. And for purposes of the non-specialty crops, the easiest way mathematically is just to take an average of those. When I get to the livestock, it's a whole different story. But that's the way it is for the non-specialty crops so the average, let's say for the, the first one on the list, they're malting barley, 34 cents, 37 cents. The average of those simple averages is, is 35 and a half cents. So the next slide just shows a chart of those various, um, of those various um, uh, 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 payments per bushel. So it means with the most at 47 and a half cents. Uh, the next slide shows an example, just a simple example. Let's just say, assume, uh, assume a farmer <clears throat> had uh, 80,000 bushels of corn in, in, that he produced in 2019, and he was still holding 50,000 bushels of that on inventory that was still, uh, still on priced. Okay, in this case, you would be limited to 40,000 bushels. That's 50% of your production um, because that would be the lesser of, okay, times the 0.335 bushel, 335 per bushel for payment of 13,400. Um, and that's a simple example of, of, of how it works. The next slide uh, talks about wool. Uh, we won't get into that. Wool is not a really big crop in North Dakota, but the, the, the structure is basically the same. I uh, use, the, use the, 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 the CARES payment and the CCC payment and the same dates. Now let's get to the livestock. That's where there was a, a, a lot of need there because livestock producers have been hurt more than most. And there's a single CFAP payment, okay? Uh, the payment is, is, but it's based on the sum of two components. The first, there's a payment for livestock marketed between January 15th and April 15th, okay? And then there's a payment for the highest inventory of the on-priced livestock between April 16th and May 14th. It may sound pretty confusing, but that's the way it works. And it, the next slide shows you the payments. Now the CARES Act 
there's the payment rate, and the CCC, there's the payment rate. And those are two distinct um, rates that you use for two distinct calculations. It's not averaged like the, the, like the non-specialty crops, okay? And so the various livestock is broke down into these various categories, slaughter cattle, feeder cattle, other cattle, pigs, hogs, and lambs and yearlings, okay? And these are all per head payments. So it, the next slide shows a cattle example. Let's just consider there's a, an operation that has 100 cow-calf pairs, and there's 100 unweaned 250-pound calves. Let's assume that there's a previous year, year's 100 weaned calves that were retained, and further assume that these, uh, these uh, 100 weaned calves were sold on April 13th. Now, that's, the, that's before that April 15th critical date, and let's say they weighed 800 pounds. So here's how the payment would be. The wean calves would be $100 a head. Now, if you, uh, Dave, if you could go back to the slide before that, you can see that uh, on feeder cattle with 600 pounds or more, you can see the CARES Act payment was $139 per head. And then you can go to the next slide again. And it shows uh, that times that 100 is $13,900. And the cow price then was $33. Uh, if you go back again, Dave, you can see that the 33 uh, payment rate is 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 on. Uh, you're using the CCC rate for that. Okay, ahead to the example, you can see the on lean calves are $33 ahead as well. So you get a total of 20,500. And then I'm going to talk about this at the end. You're really only going to get 80% of that at this time, and I'll talk about that in a while. Next, I'm going to show you another cattle example. Uh, this is the same case except for the calves were sold a week later on April, 5th, April 20th after the critical April 15th date, okay? So then, uh, just because of that date, the wean calves only get $33 a head, cows are still at 33 a head, on weaned, still 33 a head. Your payment all is, is less than half of what it was under the first example. So that's kind of a critical date there. There may be some some complaints about the, the way this is calculated, but that's the way it is as we know it now. Next, I wanted to talk about hogs and pigs. Um, they define pigs as an animal weighing less than, than 120 pounds at sale. And so then producers of pigs sold between January 15th and April 15th are eligible for the $28 a head. Hogs are anything over 120 pounds at, at sale. Um, so the producers of hogs between the 15th and the 15th are eligible for $18 a head. And producers of all hogs and pigs are eligible for $17 a head uh, on the on-price inventory between the 16th of uh, after that critical 15th day and uh, May 14th. So that's the way the hogs and pigs are calculated. Next, sheep. Um, there, there, there again, uh, producers of sheep less than two years old are the ones that are eligible. For sheep over two years old, they are not eligible. For some reason, I'm not sure exactly why. Um, so if they were sold between the 15th of January and the 15th of April, you get $33 a head. Uh, producers of all sheep less than two years old, and if you sold them after that April 15th, then you're only going to get $7 a head. So it, it's uh, so that's uh, that's the way that works on the on the live on the livestock. Uh, I guess I have the dairy next to talk about on the next slide. Um, that's just based on milk production, um, and you're eligible. To, uh, I'll just read that first one. Uh, you're eligible to receive four point seven one dollars per hundred weight on the milk produced. Now it, this is in the first quarter of 2020, and for the second quarter. I'm not sure how they came up with this, but you're eligible to receive $1.47 per hundred weight on 101.4% of the milk uh, produced in the, in the first quarter. A little confusing there, but basically mathematically it works out to $6.20 per hundred weight on all milk produced. So for example there, if you had 500 cows and you produced uh, 20.2100 per cow per month, the first quarter would give you 30,000 375 weight of milk, and that would be times the uh, 6.2, uh, and, and you would get a, 
6.2 per hundred weight. Okay, so that's the way the dairy uh, the dairy works. Next, they also broke it down into specialty crops, and I won't get into this much at all because we don't have many specialty crops grown in North Dakota. And this is very important, especially for for the in California, Florida places where they grow a lot of these fruits and vegetables. And um, and there's a list of all the various fruits a whole, and vegetables, a whole slug of them, and nuts and other beans and mushrooms. And there's a separate chart. I didn't put that in my presentation. There's a chart for the, the CCC payment and for the CARES payment and for what they call kind of a spoilage payment. And if you go to the next slide, it just a, a simple example of how it, how, it, how it works. It still uses those same dates between January 15th and April 15th. And it's multiplied uh, by the rate for sales losses in that time period. Um, and then there's that, that separate third rate that's used for, for, um, for sh uh, spoilage. Uh, uh, and that's a separate rate that's, that's included. So, and that's all I'll talk about on the specialty crops. Next, I'm gonna go into the eligibility. Now there's a $250,000 limit per person, uh, uh, per, per person or I should say, or entity. For, for all commodities combined. Uh, there was a $125,000 commodity limit, but that was thrown out and they left this 250K in there. And, and as, as far as my research goes, that uh, you can still get that, that payment, that, that limit is still in effect. Even if you get other, uh, other program uh, payments, other farm program payments or PPP loans or SBA idle loans, uh, this is a separate uh, eligibility payment just for this particular program. But you still must certify, you must meet your $900,000 AGI limitation as well. Um, and then you also must be in compliance with, uh, this goes along with most of the farm program rules, you must be uh, com uh, in compliance with the highly erodible land and the wetland conservation provisions. So that's uh, pretty simple on the eligibility for the program. There's maybe a lot of people that have never been to an FSA office that were that will want to try sign up for this that aren't that aren't used to it. Uh, farmers around North Dakota they're pretty well used to it. Livestock if you're strictly a livestock program you probably don't go to FSA that often, and uh, so uh, uh, so you you probably aren't uh, uh, you, you probably aren't accustomed with some of the some of the rules. So next. I wanted to talk about the payments. As I mentioned, the, the $125,000 commodity limit was, was eliminated. And, um, uh, and we have this $250,000 uh, per recipient uh, a limit now. And they did, they did change that a little bit. They also, they made it a little more liberal for different entities, for, for, for partnerships and, and shareholders. They, 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 they relax some of the rules on that. Uh, I won't get into the details on that. Uh, and as I mentioned, USDA now, they will, whatever you turn, whatever you turn out, uh, uh, calculate for your payment, they're only gonna pay 80% of that as a direct payment at this time. They're, they're holding back 20% to see how the program works, to see if they have any funding left. If there's funding left, they will pay out to 20%. If they run out of funding, then I'm not sure. The, I suppose they'll try to get uh, get refurbished or not, or or whatever. But uh, right now, they're only going to pay 80 percent. So that's what you can count on for a payment: uh, 80 percent of your of your calculation. Now, the next slide uh, talks about applying for assistance. Now, applications are already can already be taken, and uh, on this would be on Tuesday, then May 26th, right after Memorial Day. And I don't know that FSA is ready for that, but, that, but that's what they're that's what they say. Uh, you need you better call you call ahead because FSA is not taking any face to face appointments and find out you know how to how to how to get the process rolling. They they did say they are going to try and streamline it, um, and probably probably in some kind of the same fashion as they did with the MFPs. You probably just sign this sign everything, provide your documentation later. Now, as far, as far as what documentation you need, you can furnish almost anything that you have. If you have crop insurance records, if you have scale tickets, if you have um, re receipts, 
uh, 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 scale uh, receipts, way, way tickets, custom combiner records, uh, it, uh, almost anything that, that you have can be used uh, to document the, the, uh, the inventory and, and your production. And, and you will probably re be required to furnish some of that documentation at a, date, at a later date. And also you may be audited. Uh, the FSA, they have their plate full <laughs> with all these different programs, but that doesn't mean they aren't gonna do some spot check audits as well. Now audit uh, applications are accepted through August 28th. Uh, there's also a website that's very good, farmers.gov slash CFAP. Next. There's a lot of concerns, um, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, that, we'll, that we will get worked out in, in the future. And don't worry about if you don't know the answer right today, it will find out the answer at some point. One of the questions was, well, I still have corn in the field from last year. Is that considered my inventory? Did, did, I, store, did I store it in the field? You know? Well, then what, how many bushels is it? What, is, did they do an appraisal? You know, things like that. There's a lot of those, those specific questions that are yet to be ironed out. And some, if, and some, and some crops that, that are not included, if, if some of the commodity groups can, say, can, can come after the fact and say, hey, we've got a 5% drop here. You didn't consider this or you didn't consider that. Uh, you, they still may be able to take that. And then here's a, a, a list of, of some of the things that were not included. As I mentioned, sheep that are more than two years old, and, and, and uh, poultry really wasn't covered as well. Uh, you can see also alfalfa, forage crops, hemp, and tobacco as well. So with that, that's kind of an overview of this legislation. And I'll, t I'll turn it over to Tim, and he can expound on this, this uh, cattle payment. OK, good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, go to my first slide, if you would, an extension livestock marketing economist. Yeah. Uh, Ron showed you this before, so I just want to explain it a little more. The column there that says CARES Act payment rate, you only get that side if you sold livestock. If you didn't sell the livestock and you have them in inventory, then you use the right hand CCC payment rate, which is quite a bit less. So on the right hand side inventory, on the left hand side, uh, you sold them. Another little glitch over there under the different commodities, well, start off slaughter cattle, mature cattle, that uh, would be uh, cull cows or cull bulls that you sold, okay? Slaughter cattle and fed cattle, the way it reads now, and I, I better, I was going to tell you this at the beginning and forgot. We are just providing information the best we know it. We are not official USDA. And so, um, like Ron said, they'll be putting out more information and when you call them, they are the ones that have the final say. We're just providing information the best that we cleaned it so far. So on the slaughter cattle, fed cattle side, the way it read was that fed cattle had to weigh 1,400 pounds, 1,400 pounds or 800 pound carcass weight. And there are a lot of fed cattle that weigh less than that, that if you're going by the strict rules here and, not, and USDA is made aware of this and there's thinking that they may lower that uh, fed cattle. But as of now, if they, the fed cattle do not weigh 1400 pounds, they fall down to the feeder cattle 600 pounds or more. So we we'll gotta wait and see on that, that could be changed. And then you have uh, feeder cattle, doesn't matter whether they're steers and heifers, less than 600, over 600, and so on. So go to the next slide. I've just, uh, what I've done here is, you know, Ron had some examples, and so I kind of tried to spell this out a little bit more in terms of maybe that you could do for your own herd. So I just said, let's take a typical 100 beef cow spring calving herd up here that also does backgrounding, which then would typically uh, sell at, you know, after the first of the year or after January 15th possibly, and I'll kind of go through this. So start off with cattle and inventory. You take the cattle that you have on inventory between April 16th and May 14th, you take the largest number that you have in that time period. So 
We got a hundred cow spring cow herd. We got a hundred beef cows. You get thirty-three. Maybe we, you know, we got ninety-five calves that were born. So they get thirty-three on them. Also, typically, most producers have some replacement heifers that they plan to breed this summer, uh, that would replace uh, some cows that they call in the fall. So again, they're an inventory. You get thirty-three. You got some bulls. They're 33. So about anything you got an inventory of cattle, just put them on there and uh, might have to prove it later, but you get $33, okay? Go down to the sales then. Sales again had to be made January 15th to April 15th. So let's say these then are last year's calf crop and you hadn't sold them yet, you backgrounded them and then you sold them there during the typical marketing period. Uh, that would be January, 15th to April 15th for this rule. So uh, let's just say maybe February you sold, let's say you had then 90 calves from last year's calf crop, 45 steers and 45 heifers, okay? So we got 45, 850 pound steers. We sold them February 15th. You get $139 a head. Uh, I have 28 heifers on there because if you go up, we kept 17 back, they're in inventory, didn't sell them, they're a replacement heifers, so we got 28 left to make our 45, sold them, we get 139. Uh, cull cows, if you sold 17 cull cows, typically maybe we would sell them more when we PG them back in the fall, but if you did keep them and sold them between January 15th and April 15th, you get uh, uh, $92 I added on for the cull cows and if you had a bull there however many bulls so you know that's the kind of the, the, the way you work it uh, total up the total then and like Ron said you multiply it by 80% so that's 15144 and the second payment there is in jeopardy you know go back Kind of like he mentioned, go back to up there in the sales date, April 15th. April 15th was a Wednesday. And, you know, so if you sold your 45 steers and 28 heifers on Wednesday, April 15th, 139. Uh, several auction markets in North Dakota sell on Thursday. Thursday was April 16th. If you sold them on April 16th, that's too late to get your 139, but you still had them in inventory on April 16th. So you get 33, you know, uh, quite a bit less there. So that's kind of the way it works. Go to the next slide. Then uh, Ron mentioned this, but uh, getting lots of questions. How do we document our inventory? And that is a good question. So this is what the rule said. And again, you're gonna to have to talk to your FSA office. You know, sometimes I know we had uh, disaster uh, payments here a year or so ago and they left uh, some discretion to the county committees because they were aware of how bad the disaster might be in that area and so on. So again, like Ron said yesterday, uh, they received uh, education. So you'll have to find out for sure for cattle or lambs, whatever it might be, what documentation they want. Like he said, the rule said you were generally self-certified now, but you might have to provide supporting documentation. The final rule, kind of like he said, examples of supporting documentation include evidence provided by you that is used to substantiate the amount of production or inventory reported, including copies of receipts, ledgers of income, income statements of deposit slips, veterinarian records, register tapes, invoices for custom harvesting, records to verify production costs, contempor contemporaneous measurements, truck scales, and so on and so on and so on. So again, my suggestion is when you call the FSA to get, ask them what they might uh, uh, need for your particular case for your different type of livestock. So go to the next slide. Again, we'll take questions if we can. We're not, a, again, official USDA spokesman. Just finish up with what I've been talking about before. We're still selling uh, feeder cattle here. Uh, AMS just reported Napoleon and Mandan last week because Stockman's had a special cow-calf sale and didn't sell 
uh, feeder cattle, but the prices were virtually identical to last week. I've been talking about those 750 to eight weights down there, 155 head, you see a 752 to 799 weight steers. Just this last week averaged 132.42, almost identical to the week before, which was 132.83. So had a very steady market on feeder cattle the last several weeks. Go to my last slide then. Uh, this has way been overshadowed, obviously, by the payments you're going to get and so on. But there is a cattle on feed report out this afternoon, 2 o'clock. And uh, the trade there is just expecting about 5.2% less cattle on feed. Again, like last month, a lot less play payment uh, placements, almost 23% uh, less placed and also marketed, which were way up last month. The marketings are way down this month because of the packing plant closures and limitations, so on down about 25%. So with that, I think that's all I'm gonna talk about. See if Ron can answer some questions. Okay, thanks, Tim. And we'll start with the first question and you guys can wrestle over it. Where did they come up with the $33 per head for on the cows? Uh, I'll, I'll take the question and plead ignorance. They, they have only have so much money in the pot. They don't even know if they can pay the additional 20 uh, percent they know knew uh, how many beef cows we had on January 1st was uh, NAS did the inventory so they knew how many cows were in inventory then they multiplied it by through to see how much that was and then they looked at how much they were going to have to pay in feeder cattle and they said eh, eh, it looks like maybe we can pay that much that is my best guess Great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, another question uh, for you and Ron to decide, uh, are futures contracts considered price of grain or livestock? I think that's probably one of the questions that we don't know exactly how they're going to handle that. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Do you have any, any more thoughts on that, Tim? I do not have any more on that. If you, like on those spring calves that you got, if you would have forward contracted them to a feedlot at a price for November delivery, then you've priced them and, and I would say then you wouldn't get your $33. In the case of a futures market or an even more important, an options market where you just have a floor price, or even we have a question about livestock risk protection. Livestock risk protection, you haven't priced your livestock, you don't even have to have to sell them. And uh, you know, you can, you can uh, and, and that's a floor price and you could do that for fall, but then decide to keep them back around them, do another LRP contract, decide to feed them a slaughter weight and do another. So you really have not priced them, but you've used some price risk protection. So USDA, is gonna to have to answer that question. We cannot answer the question. All right, uh, I'll do my best to read this. Uh, I'm not sure what the significance of the average payment rate is, unless you're saying that it's the amount that will be paid on 100% of inventory. I was interpreting the tables in paragraph H to include payment rate, not purely the price decline measurement. Are you interpreting the language to say average payment rate multiplied by 50% of inventory? Yes, that's that's the way it is. You're 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 getting half of those two rates, so you might as well just average them and use an average rate. That's kind of the the guidance we we had gotten from the USDA. Uh, a question that came through the chat. Uh, any I been addressed a little bit, but I I think it's an important question we all have. Uh, any idea how CFAP will treat the 2019 crop still in the field? Yeah, we kind of addressed that before. Uh, it, you, in, in order for, for them to treat, treat that, uh, you, you have to know some, you have to have some kind of appraisal to know how many bushels are there, some way, somehow, in order to treat that. Uh, and then, and uh, uh, that, that's the first that's the first criteria. You're going to have to figure out how many bushels are there, and that's a big question mark because it still might not be able to be harvested. There's there's winter loss. Uh, who knows? I guess. But yeah, that's a big question mark. Thanks, Ron. Uh, yeah. The last yeah, guys, that's the question. Yearling, do yearling bulls qualify for production sales? I assume they would, would count as feeder cattle. That was a previous year's calf crop. And so I assume they count. 
not positive on that, but that's my assumption. Now they would count just like uh, uh, regular feeder cattle. You wouldn't, yeah, at that, that, that payment. That's what I'm assuming now. Oh, great, thanks, Tim. It has, uh, to be, it has to be verified by USDA though. Uh, so that's all the questions we have right now. I'll give uh, the participants a chance to ask uh, questions here as I cover some things. Again, use a Q&A tool if you have any questions. Uh, as you close, if you've been here before, uh, you'll be invited to complete a short survey uh, about the, the program and, and any topics you might want to hear about in the future. Um, also, and I got a question from email about this as well, uh, the re a recording, this recording, as well as uh, the PowerPoints and PDF format will be posted to both of the sites on the, on the screen and all of our previous uh, recordings and, and PowerPoints are there as well. Uh, as no more questions are coming in, I'd ask the panelists if there's anything that, that came to mind or any last remarks they might want to make. I guess I wanted to say that we'll, we'll know a lot more information here in a week or so when FSA gets their, gets their rules figured out. And uh, it's just a lot of unknowns at this point, but uh, don't, don't worry, it's, it's, the sign up goes till August, so we'll get it figured out by then. All right, well, if there's no other questions, uh, I wanna thank everyone for participating, the panelists again for, for taking part and hope that you guys all have a safe and enjoyable Memorial Day weekend. Thank you.